Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name for the love and interest you have given every one of us to study your word. We are praying that your spirit will help us tonight and reveal deep things in your word to every one of us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you grant us the grace to, to be obedient to your word, so that the heaven we're talking about, we're reading and studying about, will be partakers of the benefits and the privileges and the joy and the blessing and the happiness of that heaven on the final day in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me a good amen. amen. I like to see that my congregation is awake. Now we're in the study of the word of God. We're in Revelation chapter 7. And we've been studying from chapter 1 all through to chapter 6. In the previous chapter, that is in chapter 6, you have revealed the beginning of the opening of the seals. And the bringing in of the period of the great tribulation. The first six seals are opened in chapter 6. And the Antichrist that deceives the world then appears. And he appears bringing a false peace. Thereafter, there will be people, there will be wars, there will be famines, there will be diseases, and there will be pestilences. And there will be the deaths of many people, earthquakes and great consternation on the earth. The time of the great tribulation will be a period, number one, of Satan's full fury upon this world. That's what we have been looking at as we have looked at uh, chapter 6 and we have seen all those uh, seals that have been opened. Not only that, number 2, it will be a time of the unleashing of the power of demons over the whole world. Number 3, it will be a time when the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit will be taken away from the earth. Not only that, number 4, it will be a time of this great tribulation when sin and evil will run loose. And then there will be absolute wickedness unchecked. A time when the hellish reign of terrorizing dictator, that is the Antichrist, will grip the whole world. And God's unrestrained fury will engulf the whole world during that period of the great tribulation. As the whole universe will be collapsing, billions of people will die in that day of God's wrath. Will God remember mercy during that period of wrath? Will anybody ever be able to get saved when those catast catastrophes are devastating the world? Will anyone be able to repent during that time of the reign of terror? Surprisingly, and perhaps unexpectedly, multitudes will turn unto the Lord in repentance and saving faith. Many will not repent, of course, as we are told in the scriptures in uh, chapter 9 of Revelation, verses 20 and 21. We're told that many will not repent at that time. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 20, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. We're told that during that time of the great tribulation, when many people will be suffering, I will expect that everybody will repent because of the devastation and the war and the suffering coming upon the world. You think that people will repent, but no, they will not repent. In fact, we are told in Revelation chapter 16, verse 9, And the man was scorched with great heat, and he blasphemed the name of God, which has power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. That means that many, many people will not repent. Yet I need to tell you this, that there are those who will repent. They will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and they will be saved. Last week, we met one group, a Jewish group, 144,000 of 12 tribes in Israel that were sealed and they were called the servants of the Lord and were told that they were spiritual virgins because there was no blame, there was no blemish, there was no spot in them. But today we're looking at another group. The group we looked at last week was totally Jewish, Israelites. But now we're looking at a group 
of Gentiles. In fact, this is going to be a Gentile multitude. This great multitude of saved people you find in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through to 17. And it tells us that there will be people of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues who will come out of that great tribulation and they will wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Let's read it together as we look at Revelation chapter 7. We're looking at it from verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, looking at it from verse 9. It says, After this I beheld, that is, after the sealing and the protection and the preservation of the 144,000 Jews that were sealed because they were servants of God, after the sealing of those people I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And it says, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four bees, the living creatures, and they fell before the throne on their faces and they worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power might be unto our God forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said, Sir, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither serve anymore, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is a multitude that will be saved during the that time of the great tribulation. Surprisingly, unexpectedly, that God will have mercy even at the time of wrath. As I look at that text, can you see number one? We see the status of the multitude in heaven. That is, these special people that pass through the great tribulation, what's their status? We're told in verse 9, they stood before the throne of God. They're glorified. They are honored. And they are accepted before the very throne of God. Number two, I see the salvation of these multitude of people in heaven. In verse 10, it says, salvation to our God. We seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And then we're told in verse 14, these are they which came out of great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Number three, I see the celebration of the multitude in heaven. Do you see at the latter part of verse 9, it said that they were, be, they were before the Lamb, and then they were clothed with robes and palms in their hands. That's the palm of victory, and the palm of, tri of triumph. You remember when Jesus Christ went into Jerusalem, riding upon the ass, then the people were having palms in their hand, which uh, some churches celebrate today, and they call it Palm Sunday. It's a celebration that the King has come. And these people having palms in their hand, you have the celebration of the multitude in heaven. Number four is the song of the multitude in heaven. And they sang and they shouted and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And then all the angels joined them, and the elders joined them, and the four beasts joined them, and they fell before the throne upon their faces, and they worshiped the Lord, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom them and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Number five, I see the service of the multitude in heaven because it tells us right there in verse 15, and therefore are they before the throne of God and they serve him day and night. Number six, we'll see the shelter and the safety of these people. You'll find that in the latter part of verse 15 because it says that 
they will serve God day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them actually in the original it means that he will tabernacle among them he will shelter them he will protect them and as you look at this you see number seven the supply the supply for the multitude in heaven because it says and they shall hunger no more and thirst and they will never thirst anymore neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat on them number eight you'll see the shepherding of the multitude in heaven because the Lord now the lamb in verse 17 it says which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them shall shepherd them it reminds you of uh, Psalm 23 that I will be in the house of the Lord forever and ever he anoints my head and my head runs and my cup runs over and then he tells us there that even in the presence of his enemies that he is going to preserve him because of that he will fear no evil the shepherding of the multitude in heaven and then number nine is the sufficiency for the multitude in heaven everything was sufficient for them now no scarcity city no need at all everything was supplied for them because they are led through and they are led by the living fountains of water and then we say the solace of the multitude in heaven because God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes you see the status of the multitude the salvation of the multitude, the celebration of the multitude, the song of the multitude, the service of the multitude, the, shel the shelter and the, so and the safety of the multitude, the supply for the multitude, the shepherding of the multitude, the sufficiency for the multitude, and then the solace of the multitude. When God himself, when he wipes away all tears from their eyes. Today we're looking at this message, a great multitude of tribulation saints in heaven. The people that came out of the great tribulation. Tribulation says now they are in heaven. The people we studied about last week, the 144,000 Jews, they were on earth. And they were sealed on earth before the wind of fury and the wind of judgment will blow upon the earth. Because they were upon the earth, they were sealed and protected so that they can be in safety. But this multitude that we're looking at now of the Gentiles, they are not on earth. They are in heaven before the throne of God and before the Lamb. It grew great multitude of tribulation saints in heaven. The three points we're going to consider. Number one, countless multitudes of tribulation saints in heaven. Un uh, innumerable. Countless multitude of tribulation saints in heaven. Number two, the company of martyred saints in heaven. The company of martyred saints seen in heaven. They had been martyred. They had been slain. They had been killed. Their lives have been taken because of their testimony of the word of God and because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number three is a comfort for multitudes of triumphant saints in heaven. Triumphant victorious they had overcome by the blood of the lamb and now there is comfort for them in heaven come back to point number one countless multitude of tribulation saints in heaven we're looking at revelation chapter 7 and we're looking at it from verse 9 after this i beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number which no single man could number just looking at them john the beloved john the apostle as he saw in this vision he saw a sea of heads up in glory and before the throne of god and he says they were of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues and he stood before the throne and before the lamb they were clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and he cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our god who seated upon the throne and unto the lamb and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders. And it says, and for beasts, these are the living creatures, they fell before the throne on their faces and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. You see here, John saw this vision of the multitudes of matter tribulation saints in heaven after he had seen the vision of the sealed 144,000 Jews on earth these uncountable multitudes stood before the throne and before the lamb that's that means that they were in heaven although they suffered during that tribulation 
because they will not want to take the mark of the beast. You say, but we have not read about the mark of the beast yet. Yes, that is true. You see, all this that we are reading now, it's like, it's like apprentices. It's like an interlude. It's like a calm. It's like telling us a summary that although the tribulation is going on, let's gather the stories together. The stories of the triumphant and the stories of the victorious and the stories of those who conquer and the stories of the people that are saved that in the midst of the deluge and the flood and the fury and everything that is going on, there are people that are coming to the Lord from this nation, from this tribe and from this other place. Let's gather the story together and before we go on to tell you the rest of what is happening at the time of the great tribulation, look at this. A great multitude in heaven that no man could even number. The first group of the saved and sealed people were just from the 12 tribes of Israel. While this second group is uh, from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, the multitudes, they gather as victors with palms in their hands, symbols of victory in their hands. And then it says, before the throne of God in heaven, it was a great surprise to John to see such a great multitude of blood washed, cleansed, redeemed, saved, purified souls coming out of the great tribulation. How did he express his surprise? His surprise was indicated when he said, and lo, a great multitude. He said, look at this, a great multitude. I thought I saw something when I saw those 144,000 Jews and they were numbered and they were sealed and they were kept in safety and then the Antichrist could not touch them and they remained on earth as servants of God. I said, praise the Lord. God is wonderful and God is merciful that 144,000 of these Jews could be saved. And look, what do I see now? Something beyond what I saw before. A great multitude. How many are they, John? Are they up to 10,000? Are they up to 100,000? Are they up to 1 million? He's telling us that I don't know the number. This is uncountable. Lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Though vast numbers of people will die in sin and rebellion. During that period of the great tribulation, immense hosts of people will be saved, will endure intense persecution and will be martyred during the same period as the time of the great tribulation. The storms and the tempest and the wars and the sorrows and the persecutions and the martyrdom of the great tribulation will not claim all souls of men for the Antichrist. Multitudes will still hear the gospel through the sealed servants of God and they will get saved. They will stand before God and they will cry with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, which seateth upon the throne and upon the Lamb. They will render praise to God for their salvation, for their deliverance from sin, and for the grace of God to endure and to overcome. And the angels will rejoice with these triumphant saints and will join them to offer praise and glory unto God. I said it was a surprise to John because he himself said, And lo, see what I see. This is surprising. But for us who look back to the Bible, it's not a surprise at all because it's been prophesied that that will actually happen. That many, many people from many nations and tongues and kindreds and people will come to know the Lord. Even in troublous times, even in difficult times, the people will call upon the name of the Lord and they will be saved. Turn your Bible to Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, I'm reading to you from verse 27. Psalm 22 reading from verse 27. It tells us there, and the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. It's telling us that when some things begin to happen on the earth and people don't know where they're going to turn and when they see all the fury and all the wrath and all the punishment coming upon the earth, then they will remember, they will remember that God is a God of mercy and they will turn unto the Lord and that's exactly what a joy has seen in Revelation that it eventually happened. In Psalm 98 verses 2 and 3. Psalm 98 verses 2 and 3 the Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness as openly, as he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. These are Gentiles. And then in verse 3 he has remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. Not only Israel that's what we studied about last week but now all the ends of the earth I've seen the salvation of our 
God. Uh, the, the point is, if during the time of the great tribulation, during the time of suffering, such people can still be saved, how about today in our own time? You say there is poverty today, you say there is suffering today, and you say that people, well, we don't know what is happening now. Look at the economy, look at this and look at this. Can anybody be saved in this present condition? Uh -uh. Even during the time of the great tribulation, earthquakes, the wrath of God, many people dying, one quarter of the whole world dying within a short period of time and wars, not only wars, devastations and destructions taking place all over the earth, people will still be saved. How much more at this time, whatever the poverty and whatever the suffering and whatever the persecution and whatever the threatening of the enemy, people can still be saved today. And if you are there and you are not born again, and you are saying it's because there's no job, it's because there's no wife, it's because there's no child. Look at this. It's because there's no food, it's because of the farming, and it's because of what we're going through. That's why I'm not saved. Then the tribulation says, will look at you face to face. They will condemn you because what they would have gone through will be much, much greater than whatever you are going through today. If they can get saved at that time, you can get saved today. And in fact, it says it's from all nations and from all kindreds and from all people and from all tribes, from everywhere, they'll be giving their lives to the Lord. I search chapter 52. I'm reading to you from verse 10. I search chapter 52, verse 10. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. It's telling us that all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Uh, wait a minute as you read some of these promises now. And then you look at the condition of the hearts of men. And you see the people that deny the Lord. And the people that refuse to repent. And the people that hate holiness and righteousness. And you're saying, how can these uh, promises be fulfilled? If during the time of the great tribulation, all the people, the only people you are looking at are the people that blaspheme God. The people that will not repent. The people that are hardened. The people that say, no, what kind of God is this? Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb because the day of his wrath has come. If that's all you are looking at, you will not look at the other side of the coin. That God can still show mercy and many people can still repent. The same thing today. If you are looking at the people you are preaching to, and this one says, no, go away with your preaching. I'm telling you that I'm hungry and you are telling me about salvation. Go away with your preaching. I'm telling you there's no job and you are talking about a salvation. I don't have any child and you are talking about salvation. If those are the only people you are looking at, you will not understand that even at this time, the grace of God can overrule and the grace of God can overcome all those things that people are passing through and if you keep on preaching the gospel and preaching the word of life, people can still be saved and people can still be righteous and holy by the cleansing by the washing of the blood of the lamb because the mercy of God is available today. All the ends of the earth shall see in the salvation of our God. It tells us in Isaiah chapter Isaiah chapter 16. Isaiah chapter 60. Reading from verse 1 through to verse 4. Verse 1 through to verse 4. Isaiah chapter 60 from verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness actual, uh, the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and the glory and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Do you see that? The point is this, even though darkness may cover the earth, even though there may be tribulation, even though it will be a time of real serious trouble at that time, yet the Lord shall arise and his glory shall be seen. And then it says in verse and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. You say all this taking place at the time when there will be so much trouble, yes, and that's the grace of God. The grace of God that surpasses whatever may be happening in the world. In fact, there's something that the Lord is telling us in Isaiah chapter 26. At a time of peace, 
There may be people that will say, I don't want the gospel. I don't want salvation. At a time when everything appears all right and everything appears that everything is cool, everything is peaceful, everything is nice and people have money and there's no trouble and every, they have more than sufficient at such a time their wealth and their riches and their happiness and their childbearing or whatever it is, their prosperity may even block their minds to the gospel. But when suffering comes, when fury comes, when judgment comes, when devastation comes, when there's destruction all over the earth, then it is at such a time that people begin to think, when will this, when will this end? When are we going to overcome all these things? And then they'll be able to go to the Lord alone, who is able to save, who is able to deliver. Look at Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading to you from verse 9. Isaiah 26, reading from verse 9. It tells us, with my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my soul spirit within me will I seek thee early for when the judgments when thy judgments are in the earth when thy judgments are in the earth when thy wrath when the fury when the destruction when the devastations when the troubles are there when the tribulation is there when thy judgments are in the earth the inhabitants of the world shall learn righteousness that's exactly what will happen at the time of the great tribulation that many many people they'll be calling upon the lord because of the the, the great things that will be happening at that time you say but the, the believers will have gone the evangelists will have gone and the preachers will have gone how then will those people know the way of salvation how will they be able to call upon the name of the lord i'm glad you asked there's an answer in revelation chapter 14 revelation chapter 14 i'm reading verses 6 and 7 that at the time of the great tribulation when the saints have gone home already when the church has been raptured already and when the evangelists and the missionaries and the pastors and the preachers they've gone already how will these people hear the gospel? How will they hear the word of God? That they will turn to the Lord and become saved. Look at Revelation chapter 14 verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. You see this? That at the time of the great tribulation. Because we are not here. God will never lack a witness. God owns the whole earth. He used, uh, he used an ass to talk to Balaam. He used the crane of the cross to talk to, uh, to speak and to remind, uh, to remind Peter. And he used the whale uh, to swallow up Jonah and to take up Jonah to the place where he wanted because all the things in the world, animals, materials, men, whatever, angels, they are the service of the Lord. And at the time of the great tribulation, he says, and I saw another angel and he's flying in the midst of heaven and he's having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And who are, who are the people that this angel will be preaching to, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people verse 7 saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come the angel will tell them all this that you see at the opening of the first and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth seals and all the devastation the destruction the disease everything coming upon the world the angel will tell them this is not accidental and this is the judgment of God it is a fury of God and he will say and that angel will be telling them fear God give glory to God give your heart to the Lord who has come to judge the world for his judgment has come worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters and that's how they will get saved then we're told in Revelation chapter 15 Revelation chapter 15, reading from verse 2. And I saw a seat where a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had got him victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the halves of God. That means, although there will be the Antichrist, although he will be threatening people, if you will not uh, buy, if you will not uh, take the mark, you will not be able to buy, you will not be able to sell, there will be no food for you to eat. There will be people according to this posture that will make up their minds from the message of the angel of God preaching the everlasting gospel saying I will not yield I will not surrender my heart I know that if I take this mark then I'm doomed forever and ever and they will pray and they will seek the face of the Lord and they will have the mercy of the Lord and it says they have the victory over the beast 
They have the victory over the, over the image and they have the victory over his mark and over the number of his name and they stand on the sea of glass. They have the harps of God to worship in their hands. And then it says they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true. Are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, for all nation shall come and worship before thee and for thy judgments are made manifest do you see that there will be people that will just be worshiping the lord because they know that this is the lord almighty himself if you turn back to revelation chapter 7 and, and you look at what those uh, people were saying that is the multitude that nobody could number you, you will see what they were saying as we were praising the lord from verse 10 and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our god we seated upon the throne and, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell down and they fell before the throne on their faces and they worshiped God saying, Amen. And blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Uh, don't you know that the saints that are represented by the 24 elders, when they, get, when they got to heaven at the end of chapter 3 and then chapter 4 because I told you before that in between chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Revelation the rapture takes place and the church in heaven is represented by those 24 elders. Don't you know it's the same song of praise they were offering unto the Lord as they were glorifying the Lord. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4 of Revelation reading from verse 8 and the four bees at each of them six wings and about him and they were full of eyes within and it says and they rest not night and day saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was and is and is to come and when those bees give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever then did four and twenty elders representing the judge also fall down up, uh, before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created that is the church had been worshipping the Lord before these saints before they died and before they went through the great tribulation before they joined them and when they joined them we'd see what they were doing they just joined in the praise and giving glory to God in chapter 5 of Revelation, chapter 5 of Revelation, reading from verse 11. You see, it's just a praise in heaven. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them had I seen blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. I pray that uh, you will be among them and that you will sing with the ransomed above, with the redeemed above, and you will not go through the tribulation, but you will go in the rapture in Jesus' name. But these people we're looking at today, let us look at point number two, the company of martyred saints, martyred tribulation saints, seen in heaven. The company of martyred tribulation saints in heaven. When we talk of being martyred, it means being slain, being killed because of their faith. Look at Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It says, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And when John saw them, he couldn't understand. He couldn't understand. He said, I saw the church before because the church was represented by 24 elders. And you say, But is this not the church? No, this is not 
not the church. If you look at the church, that is, you look at the 24 elders, you see that those 24 elders were having crowns on their heads. Those that were raptured, having crowns on their heads. But in this place, you don't see crowns on their heads. These are people, it's like a second batch. The first batch has gone. The first fruit had gone. The ones that made it at the rapture, that had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, before the sounding of the trumpet, before the dead rose, and before those of us that are alive, we join them. All those people that have been saved, they had gone to heaven, raptured to heaven. But now this is the second group, and in this second group, you find them, they have white robes, but there's no crown upon their head. And John couldn't recognize any of them. Now, if this was the church, when uh, the elders said, who are these? Arrayed in white, in white robes. John should have said, that's Peter. That's, that's so and so. That's so and so. Those are the people I minister to in Asia. Man, aha, uh -huh. those are the people I saw on the other side in the Isle of Patmos. When they came to visit me in the Isle of Patmos, he didn't recognize any of them. This was not the church. The church had gone before this time. This is the tribulation period and that's why it says I don't know. How can I know? I don't recognize anyone among them. He said, sir, thou knowest. You, you must tell me about it. And then the elder told him, these are they which came out of great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are these? That make up the great multitude standing before the throne of God in heaven. This is not the redeemed church. This is not the raptured church. Because the church had been in the presence of God in heaven. Represented by those 24 elders since chapter 4. Who are these then? The question came to John. What are these arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest John's reply meant that he who asked the question was in a better position to give the answer. Was better informed than himself. Then the revelation came in the answer of the elder, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Can I tell you what happened to them? Number one, they were pardoned. Their sins had been forgiven. Number two, they were purified. They were purified by the blood of the Lamb. Number three, they were persecuted. As they went through the great tribulation, persecution escalated, even escalated to the point of martyrdom, to the point of killing them. But they persevered. And then, number four, they persevered. Pardoned, purified, persecuted, yet they persevered. As you look at them, uh, look at this. As we're talking about these people, that these are tribulation saints. You remember in an earlier study, in Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, I'm reading to you from verse 9. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Which tells us as the first and the second and the third and the fourth seals were broken. Then all those things that came in the world, persecution came for the believers, that is the people that believed after the church had gone. And these saints were told that they were slain for the word of God. Because of the word of God, they were slain, they were killed, they were martyred because of the testimony which they held. And these ones in heaven, look at it in verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. Is this not similar? Is this not part of the people we're reading about in chapter 7? Yes, this is part of them. Because these had been killed, these had been slain, these had been martyred for their faith. And it says, it was said unto them that they shall rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. That is at this time in chapter 6 when these people were saying, when are you going to avenge our blood? Upon the people that dwell on there, they said the number is not complete yet. There are still multitudes, multitudes, multitudes that are coming that will stand their ground, that will stand if it just like you have stood. And there will be a great multitude. So rest a while and stay a while until the rest of the people will come. 
you say, what will be happening at that time? Well, we're told that uh, they will be slain uh, they, they, in chapter 20 of Revelation. It uses another word which will be very clear to you. They were beheaded because of their faith. Revelation chapter 20, reading from verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. That is, during that time of the great tribulation, the people that will hear the word of God because of the angel flying in the sky and because of the testimony and the witness and the preaching of the servants of God, the 144,000 Jews that will just be turned unto the Lord and he'll be the servants of the Lord, the witnesses of the Lord, and he'll be preaching the word, join with the word of the angel flying above in the sky and then these people will believe the word of God that they were hearing and then they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they will take their stand and they will not be they will not yield to the antichrist and they will not take the mark of the beast it says because of that they are beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God which they are, uh, which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received this mark upon their forehead and then it says and in their hand and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, uh, those people, they would miss something though. They will miss something though. What are they going to miss? You see, when the church is raptured and we are with the Lord up in the sky, while we are with the Lord, there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then these people are in the world. They are still suffering. They are still suffering. And eventually they die for their faith. They believe. It's at a late hour that they believe. It's at a troublous time that they believe. It's at the time of the great tribulation that they believe. While the saints of God redeemed and raptured and ransomed, while they are in heaven rejoicing with the Lord, all these on earth will be suffering. Eventually, if they endure, as they endure to the end, they get to heaven. But as they get to heaven, you understand? You understand? It's only their soul that gets to heaven. Their body will still be on earth here. Whereas the people that have been raptured is body, soul, and spirit all together. Because at the sounding of the trumpet, the dead are risen with their body and soul and spirit join together and we which are alive, our body will put on incorruptibility that is, it will put on immortality and then we go to heaven and while we are rejoicing in the full understanding and full possession of all our faculties, it's only their own souls that will be going to heaven going to heaven and waiting for the time when the second resurrection will take place and then it says that they'll be under the altar they'll be crying, they'll be pleading they'll be saying, when are you going to avenge our blood while we are singing, while we are rejoicing, they are missing something. So if you say, well, if I don't get saved now, I will wait until that time. So that when that time comes, I will then give my life to the Lord. Ah, what you will go through. It will be a terrible thing. It's easier now. It is better now when you give yourself to the Lord. If you look at chapter 7 of Daniel, uh, Daniel tells us about that time when, when that trouble will be going on on the earth and the Antichrist Christ the beast will be making trouble with the people that are here on the earth and he'll make trouble with the people that believe on the Lord. In Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Daniel chapter 7 verse 21, I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given unto the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. That is, the Antichrist will fight against them. But the time will come when they will overcome. How are they going to overcome? They will overcome by their faith in the blood of the Lamb. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, reading from verse 10 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. It tells us, and I had a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down and which accused them before our God day and night and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. They loved not their lives unto the death. That means that although there will be persecution, they will say, well, 
uh, I will not care for what if whatever is happening now because I know if I yield now, this is my last chance. And many of them, they will not love their lives even unto the death. They will endure to the very end. Isn't that what Jesus Christ had said will happen in Matthew chapter 10? Matthew chapter 10, I'm looking at verse 22. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. Those people, they will remember from what they were hearing and for what they are seeing, they remember that uh, this thing that is happening, you are hated of all nations, all people in the world because of your faith and because of standing for the truth. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Those people remember the word of God at that time of the great tribulation in Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 8. These, all these are the beginning of sorrows. How will they understand that? They will say, huh, the first seal is broken. Look at what happened. Second seal, look at what happened. Third seal, look at what happened. And these are just the beginning of sorrows. What are we going to do now? The Antichrist is saying, now come for your mark. You put it on your forehead or you put it in your arm. If you don't, you'll not be able to buy. You'll not be able to sell. They say, these are times of suffering. These are times of sorrow. Then somebody will say, but if you take the mark, then you are doomed forever. And then it will be hellfire. And hellfire will never end. Ah, we remember. We have read in the word of God. We remember those uh, people that are preaching. When they were preaching Revelation, they said that tribulation, pure great tribulation, will be for seven years. But hellfire will be forever and ever and ever. Whatever will happen, these seven years, let what may come. I will endure because this will just be the beginning of sorrows. In verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another that is if you are, if anybody is hiding inside the house I will not take the mark but uh, if you go to buy food can you please give me a, uh, I took the mark and you know I'm doomed forever and you want to take out of the food they'll betray one another they'll go and report at the station they'll say look at this one here he's saying he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ he will not take the mark and then the antichrist say what like Nebuchadnezzar said to Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego is it true oh Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that you will not fall down to my idol now if you reconsider your way and you hear the music and this connect and everything blowing and you bow down well but if you don't bow down which God will be able to deliver you out of my hand and these people will remember it is just the beginning of sorrows I will endure whatever will happen now and then it says in verse 12 and and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall work school, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's how those people will be saved. In fact, they are going to resist. They will resist until they give their very blood. In Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1, wherefore seeing ye, we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. They will remember that, well, even if we have to resist until our blood gushes out, even if we have to resist until they slay us, until they behead us, until they kill us, until we are martyred, we have to do it because this is our last chance. Do you remember the word of the Lord in Revelation chapter 2? Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 10. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Uh, the people at that time, you are surprised. We have such a great multitude that will take their stand. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Because they'll be considering, well, if we call this one suffering, how about hellfire? 
That is to torment Satan and his angels. And then if we get into that hellfire, it will not just be seven years and it will not just be 14 years. It will not just be 100 years. It will be thousands and millions and billions of years unending. That's why, you see, if uh, there is trouble, for example, if you are suffering, for example, and you consider what you are suffering, and you say, if I try to get out of this suffering, I'm going to land myself in another kind of suffering, which is more, much more than what I'm trying to run away from, then you'll not care for the suffering you're having now because you know that if you try to get out of it in a way that is not scriptural, you get into another kind of suffering which is higher, which is greater, which is longer, which is harder, which is unendurable. That's the reason why they will not fear. Fear none of those things when thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that she may be tried, and you shall trap tribulation ten days, just a brief time, just a short time, a limited time, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And that's the reason why these tribulations says, that's why they will endure. And that's why one of the elders said, these are they which came out of great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In the blood of the Lamb. That is how they were able to overcome. And then it tells us, while they were asked during the great tribulation, they have been washed in the blood. And they, they confessed their sins, they forsook them. They were made holy by the blood of the Lamb. They resisted the rule of the Antichrist. They resisted unto blood. Because they loved not their lives, even unto the dead. And so were they faithful unto death. They became martyrs, triumphant tribulation saints. And they passed through the gate of martyrdom. And they passed into heaven. Now, how can we be cleansed today? How can we be washed today? How can we be holy today? Because, you know, even at the time of the great tribulation, their suffering did not replace the necessity of being cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. The same thing today, whatever we're going through will not replace the necessity of being cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We're told in First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, you want to be a partaker of the people that will see the Lord on the final day. You want to be a partaker of the people that will sing with the redeemed of the Lord up in heaven. It is by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. In First Peter chapter 1 verse 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but was the precious blood of Christ as of a lamp without blemish and without spot. We're told in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 reading from verse 22 and almost all things are by the are, are by the law purged with blood. If you are going to be pardoned, you are going to be purged, you are going to be purified. It's by the blood of the lamb. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission, no forgiveness, no pardon and no removal of sin. Verse 14 of that same Hebrews chapter 9. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the everlasting, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We're told in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 is the blood of the Lamb that does it. Verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify him that he might cleanse, that he might purify. The people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Then he tells us in verse 20, now the God of peace are brought again from the dead and Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect, make you pure, make you holy, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, walking in you, that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And I hear you say, Amen. It's the blood of the Lamb that cleanses. Say the blood of the Lamb that pardons. Say the blood of the Lamb that purifies and prepares us for heaven for glory. Look at First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, not if we cover it up, not if we pretend, 
Not if we're hiding it. Not if we're continuing them. If we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to, uh, to forgive our sins and to cleanse us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse from all unrighteousness. How does that happen? Jump back to verse, uh, to verse 7. The middle part of verse 7, and the blood of Jesus Christ is son cleanses us from all sin. That's how it happens. And that's how those people that we're reading about, we're studying about today, that's how they were able to get it and they became free from their sins. I come to point number three. In point number three, we're looking at the comfort for the multitudes of triumphant saints in heaven. Comfort for multitudes of triumphant saints in heaven. In Revelation chapter 7, we're looking at verses 15, 16, and 17. Revelation chapter 7, reading from verse 15, uh, talking about these saints of God in heaven, therefore, are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall, and shall lead them unto the living fountains of water and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Amen. Amen. It says, therefore, that, that, uh, that verse 15 starts with the word, therefore. Now, what does that mean, therefore? It means because of this. It means on this account. It means on this basis. What qualified them, what qualifies them is still in the future to enter into heaven and to be comforted in the presence of God. We're told they have washed their robes. They have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Then it says, therefore are they before the throne of God. Then heaven, because the sin-stained garments that they had have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. And they have repented of all their sins and believed in the atoning blood of the Lamb. Their entrance into heaven is on the basis of the completed sacrifice and atonement of Christ, washed clean and pure. They stand without blemish in the presence of the almighty God himself. Because if sin had remained in them, they would not have been able to get to heaven. Even though they suffered, even though there was tribulation, they would not have been able to get to heaven if sin had remained in them. The same thing with those of us who are alive today. Whatever we suffer, well, we cannot say, well, God, see how I'm suffering. See how I'm suffering. Well, suffering is not good. Suffering is painful. But you must be cleansed from your sin. Because if your sins are not taken away, you will not be able to get to heaven. Because heaven is a holy place filled with glory and with grace. Sin can never enter there. All within its gates are pure from defilement kept secure. Sin can never enter there. If you hope to dwell at last, when our life on earth is past, in that home so bright and fair, you must still be cleansed from sin. Have your life in Christ within. Sin can never enter there. You live in sin here below. And heaven's grace you refuse to know. But you cannot enter there. It will stop you at the door and buy you out forevermore because sin can never enter there. That means then if you clinch to sin until you die, when, you, when your life, when you draw your latest breath, you will sink in that despair you, to the regions of the laws and then you will prove at awful cause that sin can never enter there. Sin can never enter there. No, never. Sin can never enter there. So, if at the judgment by sinful spots, sinful stains, your soul shall man, you can never enter there. And that's the reason why the Lord is calling everyone, if you hope to get into heaven, is saying in Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading to you from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 1, reading from verse 16, wash you and be clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine. I cease to do evil. Learn to do well. If you want to get to heaven, you must deal with this problem of sin. It's not enough just to come to the Bible study. It's not enough just to read the Bible. It's not enough just to be in the church. It's not enough just to be part of us. It's not enough just to say I'm a worker. It's not enough just to say I'm doing my duty. It's not enough just to say I'm giving money in the church. You must be cleansed from sin because sin can never enter there. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless and 
plead for the widows. Then come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be, a, they shall be as wool. You see, your position on earth cannot take you to heaven because God is no respecter of persons. And if you have committed private sin and secret sin and it appears nobody knows and you're still thinking that, well, I will get there because of my position. Listen, even David knew that he could not get into heaven with all his position, even though he was a king. That's why he began to pray and he said, purge me with his soap and I shall be clean. I know if I'm going to get there, I need to be clean. I need to be holy. I need to be righteous. Therefore, purge me and purify me. Purge me with his soap and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Blot them out. Wash them away. Cleanse me from them. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ that does that to day and then he began he continued to pray in Psalm 51 verse 10 creating me a clean heart oh God creating me a clean heart oh God you see all these saints were reading about the martyred saints that eventually get to heaven is because they were cleansed their sins were washed away how I pity many people that go to churches where they don't talk about cleansing, they don't talk about purifying, they don't talk about being washed in the blood of the Lamb, they don't talk about being purified in the blood of the Lamb, they don't talk about holiness, righteousness, and purity. All they do is just singing and worship and dancing and whatever it is they do and some deliverance and some prayer and some healing and prosperity and having this and having that. And that alone is not enough. You will not get to heaven with all the cars, whatever it is you have, with all the prosperity if you are not cleansed from sin. Even your position in the church or your position in politics or position in the nation or your position in the continent will not take you to heaven if you are not cleansed from sin. That's why David prayed, cleanse, uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David was saying a backsliding. David was saying I've gone back into sin. David was saying salvation is gone. The joy of salvation is gone. And the fruit of the Spirit is gone. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. He said I cannot preach now because I'm guilty myself. He said I cannot talk to sinners now because I'm a backslider myself. He said I cannot do anything. I'm telling other people to come to the Lord and believe on the Lord. I cannot work for God now because there's sin in me. You see, David was different from the people that are deceiving themselves today, living in sin and still walking in the church, living in sin and still preaching, living in sin and still witnessing, living in sin and still doing this or that in the church or in the household of faith. But he said, I cannot do anything now. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. After that, then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You see, all those people of olden days, they realized that uh, they must be cleansed from sin if they were going to see the face of the Lord. That's why uh, the, the passage you are reading, that's why it starts with it therefore. Because they were cleansed, because they were purged, because they were purified, therefore are they before the throne of God. And therefore is the Lord himself is he, be, is he with them. And he shall hunger no more and he shall thirst no more. What a wonderful promise is given unto them. Revelation chapter 22. I'm reading to you from verse 3. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 3 and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him and he shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads and there shall be no night there and they need no candle neither uh, the light of the sun for the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. I pray you will be there. In Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse uh, 3, it says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. God himself 
He will not even send an angel to do it. And he will not send another redeemed man, raptured man, to ransomed man to do it. He will do it himself. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And, they shall be, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. At that time we will rest. Maybe there's no rest now. Maybe there's trouble now. Maybe there's persecution now. But at that time we will rest. I pray that God will count you among the number in Jesus' name. In Revelation chapter 14 verse 13. Revelation chapter 14 verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit that they may rest from their labors and their work do follow them. That means then that uh, the people of God, they will rest at such a time. Go back to the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49, reading from verse 10. They shall hunger, they shall hunger, they shall not hunger nor thirst. Neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that had mercy, that has mercy on them, shall lead them even by the springs of water, and shall, he shall guide them. We're told in Isaiah chapter 35, Isaiah chapter 35, reading from verse 10, it says, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy joy and gladness and sorrow and sign shall flee away. As we read all this, I believe that in your heart you are saying, by the grace of God, I will be there. And you'll be there in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 60, I'm reading from verse 18. Isaiah chapter 60, I'm reading from verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy world salvation and thy gates praise. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. And thy God thy glory. The sun shall no more, thy sun shall no more go down. Neither shall the moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be an everlasting light and the days of thy morning shall be ended. You see that day is coming when God himself, when he will wipe all tears away and then the time of sorrow, the time of suffering, the time of mourning, everything will vanish away. We're told in chapter 25 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 25 and I'm reading to you from verse 8. He will swallow up death in victory. The Lord will wipe away tears from off all faces. And re the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. And we found that these uh, people that we're reading about today. The multitudes of martyred saints in heaven we found that even though suffering had been there now they are before the lord and yes and it says they serve the lord continually they offer constant uninterrupted service unto the lord you see here on earth their service to god was suspended and interrupted by the return of the night or the necessity of rest but now in heaven it says there'll be no weariness there'll be no tiredness therefore they serve the lord day and night and the service of the lord will be continued continued forever. And it says they hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. Coming out of the great tribulation, they suffered the pain of hunger during the great tribulation and the pangs of thirst during that famine and the wars and the inability to buy food for refusing to take the mark of the beast. Many of them suffered sunstroke uh, because of the excessive heat of the sun during the opening of the sixth seal. But now in heaven, the redeemed of the Lord as they get to heaven they are forever protected from whatever they suffered on earth for the lamp himself the lamp of God Jesus Christ shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters their happiness in heaven will be full and as fresh and ever flowing like the never drying streams God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes with their trials and tribulations over they pass from the world of weeping and the veil of tears to the very presence of God and there will be no more grief nor sorrow forever. Well, my question to you is, will you be in heaven? In God's presence, in heaven, will you be there forever? Have you repented? 
Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb? Are you holy? Are you righteous? Are you persevering in whatever difficulty, whatever tribulation, whatever trial you are going through, whatever jesting or insult of the, of the enemies or the persecutors you are going through? Are you persevering? Are you steadfast? Are you enduring to the very end? Thank God for these people. Thank God for these people. In the greatest of the times of suffering, they were able to endure. I'm sure you can endure. The grace of God is sufficient for you. If you will call upon the Lord, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. And if you keep on calling upon the Lord, he will preserve you. He will give you strength for every day. And he will say, every day, my grace is sufficient for you. Lord, I'm, I'm suffering. My grace is sufficient for you. They are persecuting me. My grace is sufficient for you. There is no job. My grace is sufficient for you. There is no wife. There, my grace is sufficient for you. See, there is too much temptation and it appears that the devil is going to pull me through the flesh and get me back into sin. My grace is sufficient for you. Whatever you are going through and whatever you see and whatever you don't see, always remember the grace of God is available. My grace is sufficient for you. If you hold on to the arm of the Lord until he comes, then we will meet in heaven and we'll rejoice in heaven forever and ever. Why don't you call upon the name of the Lord? If you have not been born again, this is your chance. Call upon the name of the Lord and be born again. If you are born again already, but there's persecution, there's problem, there's trial, there's tribulation, whatever it is you are going through, hold on to the Lord and look up to the Lord. The grace of the Lord is sufficient for you and it will see you through.